Well, that was a perfect introduction. Human health is faced with many challenges today. Some of those challenges have been with us for a long time. Some of them are very new. Some we haven't even discovered. Meeting these challenges is going to require social and political action. But even more importantly, we must remember that science has contributed massively to the solutions to these problems. Okay? We have innovated in science, and we have been innovating day in and day out and finding new ways to meet these challenges. Biology is now entering a golden age, an age where we have so much new information that we have to change the way we think about biology and the way that we do biology. I would argue that we need to start thinking more like engineers. So I'm going to equate in this talk um, solutions to biological problems uh, to engineering. So an engineer might approach a problem, they might look in and ask where they might have a technical drawing that gives them the design schematic, and that drawing tells them about how, how the parts are made and how those parts are assembled together to make a machine. Biologists didn't have this, don't have this kind of a road map. Instead, we have to start with an organism, something that is much more complicated than any machine that humankind has created. We've had to work backwards to figure out what the molecules are that make up these organisms, and now we know a lot about the blueprints what those blueprints are like and how they're written into the DNA, into our genes and our genetic code. We're now in an age where advanced technologies have allowed us to read and gather that information from the DNA. And we need to start to rethink how we use that information to intervene in problems, of, uh, in biological problems. Let me give you an example. The human genome, uh, the human genome, when it was first sequenced, that is, when that information was first read from the DNA, took about three years and cost about $100 million. Today, we're able to sequence a genome, maybe your genome, for about $2,000 in about two weeks' time. The day is coming, or the day is already here, where you're going to walk into the clinic and the doctor is going to sequence your genome as a way to try and help make predictions about disease, uh, about the disease state that you have, and make predictions about your treatment. There's a tremendous amount of information there, and it requires the use of computer, computer science, bioinformatics, to ferret through that information and find the key points in, uh, within that information that can be used to inform treatment. Uh, we're still far, though, from having that master blueprint. Okay? We can't necessarily sequence your DNA, draw out that blueprint, and pinpoint the weak spots, pinpoint the spots that need to be changed. Instead, we are still looking at something that's much more like this, a code, and we're decoding it. We're trying to read that sequence and figure out how, how the instructions in your DNA uh, define your makeup, define the makeup of a living organism. Now, don't get me wrong, molecular biology has made huge contributions to understanding what's going on uh, in the human genome and in the genome of, of all the species. But, there, but it's been a fairly clumsy and heavy-handed approach that we've had to use. I'll give you an example. One, uh, one way that molecular biology approaches this problem is to copy pieces of that genetic code, copy that information, and insert it into your favorite cell line or, cell, or model organism. Um, if you were an engineer, you might equate this to maybe you're an expert that works on the Volkswagen Beetle, uh, and the uh, engineer next door hands you a, a blueprint, and you go ahead and you start putting that blueprint together with that Volkswagen Beetle. The result that you get might be uh, a little bit interesting, but maybe not quite as informative as, as you might like. <laughs> okay. It tells you something about what was on that blueprint, but maybe not in a way that it, that it was intended to work. Over the last three to four years, there's been a, there's been a revolutionary change in molecular biology. You may have heard of it. It's in the news now. It's called CRISPR and gene editing. This is a technology that allows scientists to go in and make single changes very precisely and very finely. We can be the equivalent of moving a punctuation mark, deleting a letter, erasing a sentence or a paragraph from that instructional code. CRISPR is giving us a way to go in and interrogate, to interact now for the very first time with the genetic code. So instead of simply reading it and trying to figure out what pieces cause what things to happen, we can now play with it and interact with it. 
I'll give you an example. Some scientists are working on a disease called sickle cell anemia. In this disease, uh, it, the genetic code has a statement, and I've put it here in English as close as I can. The statement is, make this part asymmetrical. With CRISPR and gene editing, we can make a change as subtle as removing that A from the word asymmetrical to make this part symmetrical. That change is the equivalent of switching these sickle cell-shaped red, red blood cells that cause the suffering and disease in these patients to the normal disc-like morphology uh, that's seen in normal people. This is an example of where CRISPR is, can be used as an intervention. But in terms of interrogating and understanding the genome, it's also opening this new window. I'll give the example of a machine like this, clockwork. If we look at that clock, to understand how that clockwork really works, uh, we need to do two things. One, we need to be able to peer into that machinery and see how the pieces work together, how they push and pull on each other. We need to be able to look inside of it. Second, we need to be able to tinker with it, pull those pieces out, remove them one at a time, and see how that changes the function of this clock. Gene editing and CRISPR are giving us that tool now here for molecular biology. I'm going to show you a movie on the next slide. And that movie is of a cell that we've used CRISPR to insert a fluorescent protein, a molecular highlighter, and attach that to some of the machinery in that cell. By using optical imaging, we can look inside that cell and we can see its machinery moving. There are two colors here. One is green and one is pink. Um, and, oops. Back one slide there. Get this. Try one more time. Here we go. Uh, and you can see the molecules moving. What you're watching in, in the green and the pink is the machinery in the cell processing and moving information about that cell. We're watching the molecules touch each other as that process is occurring. So this is giving us that window into the clockwork of a living cell. Okay. So not only does CRISPR allow us to watch what's happening inside the cell, but it also gives us a way to tinker with the cell, go in there and start to take those pieces of machinery out. Okay. And this is a technology called genome-wide screening. Here we can go into the genetic code and we can remove one at a time the parts, uh, parts from that parts list. We can delete genes, modify them. And if we do that in the right context, we can begin to learn about how those genes affect disease states like cancer or HIV AIDS. Okay. We identify those specific targets, gene targets, that may be the, the next treatments or the next intervention uh, for those problems. Okay, so CRISPR is a tool and genome editing is a tool. It's a tool that's going to allow us to understand the genetic code and not only be able to read the genetic code, but how the genetic code really defines the blueprint of all living things. It's a new frontier and a new technology that is going to change medicine and biotechnology. My call to you is to learn about this technology. It's a powerful tool. We're interfacing and interacting with the very makeup of ourselves. And it's going to become real, and it's going to be part of what you see in the future. This is, this is going to impact probably everyone sitting in this room. So I'd encourage you to go out and learn about this technology, learn what it's doing, and learn what its applications are. Thank you. Thank you.